doesn't need much introduction. He himself, whatever he presents, uh, will be an introduction for uh, him. So I invite uh, Dr. Willers uh, to make his presentation, please. Thank you and good morning. Well, I guess it's a little late for good morning. Good afternoon. Um, going to talk a little bit about an overview of hermetic storage, and I'll touch on two other issues which are of, I believe, great importance, uh, dealing with the problem of aflatoxins and its public health effect, and also uh, safe seed storage, since the technology of preventing oxygen uh, is relevant to all three. So uh, the next slide, I'd hope to show you a 20 second video taken just a few weeks ago, but apparently there's a technical glitch, so you won't have a chance to see it. Won't see it. Uh, but first, what is ultra-hermetic storage? We use the term ultra-hermetic because it means that the respiration rate of the insects, which we colloquially call our engine, uh, is greater than the infiltration rate, thereby driving down the oxygen to an unbreathable level and raising the CO2 typically to about 15%. Requires no pesticides whatsoever, and you saw earlier today an excellent example of its use in wheat in India. What is it used for? As you can see, a large number of commodities, as long as they're dry commodities, in our experience, it works across the board. What do man portable bags look like. You've seen pictures of them. Here's an actual small one. Fits better in my briefcase than the large ones. And by the way, I've got a few handouts here for those interested afterwards. And on the left, you see a nice example from Nepal. This uh, young woman works at a cooperative. And you can see her bags with the outer bags there, which are either proper, probably propylene or jute. On the right, you see large hermetic storage. This is Cargill in the Philippines. Uh, both of them happen to be storing maize, and um, it can be used either indoors or outdoors, man portable in the left. Very few of us want to raise 150 tons on our own. You want to see a really large one? Here's an Indian installation. This is a thousand ton cocoon. Very useful in strategic stores, which countries are beginning to learn is an important element in stabilizing prices and therefore protecting poor farmers at harvest and poor urban dwellers much later. Next, I'm going to show you some uh, data which actually is uh, weeks old. It comes from the World Food Program in Uganda. They worked with uh, 1,600 farmers and got some very interesting data looking at various forms of hermetic storage versus conventional. And you'll notice that the losses over the period studied was 0.78%, I say 0.78% with the modern hermetic storage versus an astonishing 41 plus percent conventionally. <coughs> Next, from the same study, you see that because the farmer was able to wait for 90 days, uh, the value of the crop went up. Not a surprise, but the average is interesting, 144%. And if you look on the right-hand side, surprise, surprise, 97% of the farmers 
said that there'd been a financial gain. They're not stupid. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, this is a basic curve. Many of you are familiar with it. That's why hot, humid climates are so terrible in terms of insect <coughs> losses. 30 degrees is the optimum temperature to grow them. And as you see in this example, uh, the Indian meal moth, 30 to 60 day lifetime, and in that lifetime producing up to 200 eggs. Hence the exponential growth in hot, humid <coughs> climates when unprotected. We'll turn now to the aflatoxin problem, which as you know, depresses the immune system with terrible consequences in terms of facilitating cancer, HIV, stunning of children, and a few other nice consequences. And so here's some data on what happens in storage and its exponential growth. This comes from a ICRISAT study in Mali. And as you can see, the aflatoxin concentration in each of these villages went up remarkably under <coughs> conventional treatment. On the average, 200%. Since the international standard is 10 to 20 parts per billion, you can see that that's not a happy circumstance. Another piece of data, this time come from Millennium Village in Uganda. And you can see the bottom line, yes, there was some increase in hermetic storage. Look at the top line, you can see unprotected storage and an in-between value. Uh, and that's why if you want to protect your grains, yes, you want to do something before harvest, and that's where Aflasafe has made an important role. But then you don't want to have the residual one growing exponentially, and that's where hermetic storage has an important role to play, something which is not yet as widely recognized as it will be. And finally, I'll turn to peanuts, because peanuts are one of the worst cases of aflatoxin growth. And this particular study shows a measure is so-called mole colony forming units, starting at 200, conventionally went to 40,000, and that's after only 90 days. You notice with the first form of hermetic storage, it went to 1,700, because peanuts happens not to bring the oxygen down as fast. It's one of the anomalies. But if you add a little CO2 in the next column, you can see you've cut the growth in half, which is why we recommend CO2 or alternatively a sachet of oxygen absorber uh, to prevent that particular problem. Turning now to solar drying. Why solar drying? Because most of the world can't afford thermal drying uh, using uh, renewable, unrenewable resources in most cases. And so solar drying is essential. If you don't properly dry your grains, nothing will help you. So first you dry below the critical moisture level, and we have some experiments that suggest in hermetic storage you can actually get away with a little bit more, like 18%. Um, you can protect from sudden rain by designing your drying system that way. And you can block moisture coming from below, which slows the drying process. Otherwise, whether it's a road surface or a concrete surface, you are actually re-wetting from underneath. The most advanced of our solar dryers, which you saw previously, this example is a very recent one, also from India, uh, storing turmeric. It uses solar gain, the bubble protects from rain, and some very light fans drive cooling air, not cooling air, but drying air across the surface, either on grid or, as you see here, 
off-grid with a small solar array. It takes a little less than 100 watts. Turning now to seed st storage. Oops. Got ahead of myself. Yes. Turning now to seed storage, a very important application because study after study, starting with very extensive work at Erie, have proven that for all the seeds tested, you can preserve germination and vigor about as well with hermetic storage as you can with air conditioning or refrigeration. A very, very important finding with enormous economic and energy consuming consequences. And here you see one of the world's largest users of hermetic storage for seeds. This is uh, Bayer Crop Sciences in Peru. On a smaller scale, you see rice paddy seeds in um, five-ton cocoons in the Philippines. And here's a study done in the Philippines which shows, not too surprisingly, that the results of hermetic storage, air-conditioned storage, and refrigerated storage are about the same and uncontrolled with germination level in six months goes down to a totally unacceptable level, which is why it's proving very popular. Here's what actually happens to oxygen level. As you can see, in a matter of days, it becomes unbreathable. In some cases, there's a little bit of a bounce back. You saw one of the earlier slides, not in the one I'm showing here, which is from the Philippines. Uh, to look again at larger units, we happen to call them cocoons, you can see both examples of inside and outside storage. This, these two examples are from Rwanda, and as many examples are maize, because maize is the most common, followed by rice in terms of hermetic storage, and then there are many others, including, interestingly enough, uh, cash crops such as coffee and cocoa. And I have right here a demonstration model of the cocoon. This doesn't look like a thousand tons because it isn't, but the principle is the same, the material is the same, and the results are the same. So um, moving right along, this again shows the smaller units and on the right, the intermediate size one ton unit. We've most recently introduced a mini grain safe as an alternative to tin silos, which holds 250 kilos and we're developing a 500 kilo version. We think it's a very interesting alternative and we've been able to get the cost down to $50 FOB factory. Where is her ultra-hermetic storage currently used around the world? Oops. I'm sorry, I was one behind. Uh, that's the one-ton unit on the right, and of course the same portable bag on the left, the super grain bag. So that's where it's currently used, 107 countries, so we've still got about 60 to go. And we have benefited both directly and indirectly from international sources. This is some of the areas funded by USAID, and these are the direct funded organizations which introduce hermetic storage in a series of circumstances. And the next one shows the same data for WFP, which has both promoted hermetic storage and is a user of hermetically stored products. And that overview here, and on the right you see, by the way, the new mini grain safe, the one I spoke about. This shows that there are many varieties of form to deal with many applications. So the principles all are the same. Make sure the respiration is greater than the inspiration, if you want to call it that. Thank you very much.
And I look forward to your questions when we have time for it. <laughs>